Whether it's an expulsion, a teenage pregnancy, drug use, or school violence, there's a lot of students who don't stay in school and graduate high school. But what happens to these students? Well, many times they're facing significant obstacles, whether it's an abusive home situation, uh, their parents are using drugs, financial hardship, or any number of other difficult home situations. So the likelihood of these students receiving a good education at home is usually pretty low. A lot of these kids, unfortunately, end up on a path to the prison system, into gangs or homelessness. But fortunately, it doesn't have to be that way. And today I'm talking to Charlie Rice, who's the executive director of Shehalem Youth and Family Services and program manager of YUP, which stands for Youth Opportunities Program. YUP is a program at Shehalem Youth and Family Services, and in many ways, YUP acts as the safety net for young people who face many of these barriers to education and the workforce. At YUP, young people between the ages of 16 and 24 can get the help they need to finish their education and enter the workforce, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts, a local realtor here in Newburgh. I'm a member of the Newburgh New Rotary Club, an ambassador for our local Chamber of Commerce, a city club member, and also I have a separate YouTube channel about Newburgh and real estate. But I love this town. I love helping people move here, and I love sharing about all the uh, great organizations and people who make this town the great place that it is. And that's really what this podcast is all about. Sharing stories of hope and uh, generosity in Newburgh and the surrounding area with the idea of helping people be inspired, getting involved, and having hope for our future. So I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Charlie Rice as we talk about you. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for being here with me today. Look forward to uh, doing this episode together and learning about YUP and uh, Shehalem uh, Youth and Family Services. It's glad, good to have you on. Thank you for inviting me. You are very welcome. So many people in Newburgh probably have heard somewhat about uh, Shehalem Youth and Family Services and YUP, um, but there may be some ambiguity about how they work together or what the different programs do. So would you mind just by starting of, of what is... Shehalem Youth and Family Services and you, and then you can also share with you know, your position within that as well as sure. executive director. Yeah. Uh, about 50 plus years ago, there were some George Fox college professors who noticed there were no social services in Newburgh and they wanted to make something happen. Hmm. So they got together and that was the creation of Shehalem Youth and Family Services. They called a, a former missionary to oversee the organization and act as executive director at that time, uh, Bill Cathers. And he served for many, many years until he retired. At one time, Shehalem Youth and Family Services provided residential treatment for middle school and high school age youth who weren't able to live at home for one reason or another. Some didn't have homes. Some were wards of the state. Um, others had homes that we were hoping they could go back to once they were stabilized emotionally and behaviorally. And so the residential treatment program helped those youth. Um, a little later, uh, Shehalem Youth Family Services opened a counseling center, and then shortly after that, they started the Youth Opportunity Program that we call YUP. So we've got the first two letters of youth, YL, first two letters of opportunity, OP, stuck them together. And made up a word, <laughs> you. Um, Shehalem Youth and Family Services also provides a uh, supervised parent visitation program for non custodial parents who are required to have supervision when they're with their children. Currently, the only two programs that Shehalem Youth and Family Services provides are the U program and the Shehalem Parenting Connection Program, our supervised parent visitation program. Okay, so the residential part of it where the, the young people would come, that's no longer that, in existence? That's right. That, okay. that program was closed. Uh, we also closed the uh, clinic, the counseling clinic. Gotcha, okay. 
so now it's the so with this um the program that's designed to bring the families together under supervise uh, under supervision mm-hmm. and the with you the youth opportunities uh, can you give a breakdown of how how those work so with with you what does that actually look like when someone goes through that yeah so um the purpose of you is to provide support for youth and young adults who are needing help in two main areas first um educationally to help them finish their high school either their diploma or their GED and then the second area of support that's provided is to help them be successful employees hmm. so we like to think that we're helping make taxpayers <laughs> basically and um UP is, is funded ultimately from the Department of Labor. Back in the late 90s, 1998, the government decided that they wanted to help people get to the point where they didn't need to rely on the government as much for various programs, food stamps, welfare, other welfare-type programs. And so they thought if if they could invest tax dollars into helping people make more money, they might not need as much help from the government. Hmm. So they passed a law called the Workforce Investment Act. The idea was to invest tax dollars into helping people get to the point where they could make more money and not and you know be more self sufficient, not have to rely on government programs as much. Yeah. And the way that worked, they sent these tax dollars out, and they still do, it's still working, across the United States. Here in our area, uh, the local workforce board located in Salem is Willamette Workforce Partnership. They then distribute those funds to the four counties that they oversee one of which is Yamhill County. And so um, about 14 years ago, Shehala Youth and Family Services applied to be the Youth Workforce Development Program for Yamhill County. And we were awarded that, that grant. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and so that's a renewable grant. Um, every three years, we have to apply again. We're coming up through renewal in 2024. The uh, contract is renewed annually. And so our direct funder is Willamette Workforce Partnership in Salem. But ultimately, the money comes from the Department of Labor through that Workforce Investment Act, that law. It was tweaked a little bit back in 2014. They added some opportunities and change the name to the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. But it's still the same idea, help youths and young adults become successful. So what kind of skills are, are taught during this program? Well, um, first of all, we help them finish their high school. Many come to us most as high school dropouts and mm-hmm who have decided to get their GED. And so there's tutoring and uh, providing ways that they can learn what they need to learn to pass the GED tests, including our partnership with with, uh, Chemeketa Community College, which has a a very strong uh, GED preparation program. Some Some of our participants are able to take advantage of that. Many of our participants are done with school. It just didn't work for them. Even Chemeketa Community College's GED preparation program. And so we provide in-house support uh, to tutor them to help them learn what they need to pass those, pass those GED tests. Then in addition, um, we try to find all of our participants some kind of work experience 
and pre-employment training. So pre-employment training um, includes practicing job interviews, writing resumes, learning how to be a successful employee by discovering the wrong kind of thinking and 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 finding better ways to think as a person and as an employee so that they can be successful. As far as the uh, preparation for a career, for a job leading hopefully into a career, uh, we're able to help them get their driver's license, if they need work clothes or interview clothes, that government money, ultimately from the Department of Labor, allows us to support them with the cost of those kinds of things. If they need a haircut for a job interview, if they get a job, well, we had a fellow um, who got his first job at Taco Bell at New Burt. <clears throat> As a new employee, they gave him three shirts and a harp. He had to get his own black pants, black non-skid grease-proof shoes. So we took him over to Fred Meyer and were able to get those things that he couldn't get when he started the job. Yeah. So that, that's just an example. And so is that also kind of double as an internship program or is it not quite? Well, the internship um, the work experience um, can come in, the, in in two forms, either job shadows or short-term internships. And so we have businesses in town. Uh, we have one of our youth offices is here in Newburgh. We have another youth office in McMinnville so that we can more easily serve the residents of PM Health County. And there's businesses in communities throughout Yamhill County who help us and help our participants by hosting job shadows and short-term internships. For the job shadows, we pay the participant to go hang out in a business. Some of the businesses actually put them to work. Hmm. Sometimes menial labor, sometimes actual productive labor. The internship is um, a, a short-term internship, but it can range from 50 to 200 hours, mm. depending on what the business is able to handle. Um, the, the business doesn't pay anything, but what we expect from the business is to have a heart of mentorship to help bring the participant along through the different tasks that they do. They have a regular schedule. Many of them use the same time clock system as the other employees, mm -hmm. but we pay them an hourly wage. And so uh, starting in July, we'll be paying our interns $16 an hour. They will have taxes taken out of W-4s and I-9s, just like a regular job. Um, then next February or January, we'll probably help them. Some of, I've already been helping a lot of them prepare their very first tax return. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this provides the work experience that they can put on their resumes, that um, it gives them a chance to learn. They have weekly evaluations that the employer fills out on some of the skills some people refer to as soft skills, showing up on time, doing what you're supposed to do, getting along with coworkers, getting along with supervisors, that sort of thing, to, to help them become successful. That sounds like a great program. I think, like what you said, rather than waiting till someone is, you know, gets just caught up in the welfare system, kind of taking some steps back mm -hmm. and, and investing up front. It kind of reminds me, um, like a later stage of a family place. I don't know if you mm -hmm. do any coordination with a family place. Some of those students might 
be good graduates up into the, the UP program? Well, we prefer a lot of our participants to a family place because of the diapers mm. that they have. Uh, some of our participants are single parents with little babies and yeah, a family place we consider to be one of our community partners. Yeah. So is there, what is the, the age range of people who come through the program? We can enroll ages 16 to 24. Okay. Once they're in and say they turn 25, they don't age out. So the 16 to 24 bracket is for the enrollment. Okay. And then when they have met their original initial goals, and that might be getting their GED, getting a job, uh, getting their driver's license, maybe starting some classes at PCC or Chemeketa. Once they've met those initial goals, then decided on a case-by-case basis, they are graduated into what we call follow-up services, hmm. where we can still provide support, uh, tr- support with transportation, whether it's gas cards, bus passes to get to a college class or to get to work. We can provide that support for an additional 12 months hmm. after we graduate them into follow-up services. But from the point of enrollment to the point where we graduate them into follow-up services varies from individual to individual. Some, it might take two or three months. Others, it might take years, and it has. Um, We have one who recently graduated into follow-up services after having been with us six years. And so it's a very individualized program. And I imagine some of these people who it takes longer have probably experienced a lot of um, trauma or some type of hardship to, I can only imagine, you know, trying to go through a program and if you don't have those soft skills developed and it's kind of like, okay, let's try this again. Yep. And imagine that takes a lot of patience. It does. And many of our participants come from families that have not provided as much support as some other families provide. Um, the It's easy for people to, to get used to receiving help from government and, and to get out of that practice of being self-sufficient. And sometimes that can go from generation to generation. That's one of the barriers that many of our participants face. We like to use the word challenge rather than barrier. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we help them overcome those to become successful. And I imagine most of that is a mindset shift, right? Yeah, it is. A lot of it is attitude. And attitude is something we can all have control over. But it sometimes takes a little more effort for some than it does for us. Can you give an example of, of what that looks like for, um, I'm sure there's probably examples. I don't know if you could tell a story with changing a name or just share, you know, kind of a hypothetical example of, of what that looks like. Someone comes in, mm-hmm. attitude they have, how you specifically help them or overcome those uh, challenges mm-hmm. to to become self sufficient. Well, Nathan came to us as a seventeen year old high school dropout. He came to us as a referral from WorkSource Oregon, a friend of his. He he decided he wanted to get on with his life. He had been um, living with his mom, but his stepdad was a toxic presence in Nathan's life. And he realized he got to the point at a young age, 17, that he wanted to do better. So a friend of his took him to WorkSource or again. WorkSource referred him to us as a 17-year-old. They 
they um, also use the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act to help develop the adult workforce, 18 years and, and over. Okay. So Nathan came to us. We enrolled him in the programs, and he was doing great. He passed a couple of uh, two of the four GED tests. And then things at home escalated. He found himself on pills. He finally was homeless. We helped with, um, we purchased him a tent and blankets and tried to support him that way. Um, there was a period of time where he didn't maintain contact with us. And uh, when we came to work one day, one of the staff found him sleeping on the front porch of our building in McMinnville. Took him inside, had a, had a strong heart-to-heart -heart talk with him that he could succeed if he set his mind to it. And so he re-engaged. Um, about that time, he decided to go back to his mom's house, but he was still having trouble with his stepdad. Nathan had adopted a dog while he was homeless with the companion chef. The dog went back home with him. But according to Nathan, the stepdad poisoned the dog mm. in an attempt to get at Nathan. And so Nathan left again. Fortunately, a sister in Washington invited him for the weekend, for a July 4th weekend. And he realized, here's somebody other than just my mom who cares about me and is part of my family. And so he decided to move to Washington. But we maintained contact with Nathan. And one, one of the days through my contact would talked to him through Facebook. Once in a while, we'd call him. He told me that he was ready to finish his GED. So I helped him get into a community college GED preparation program there. He went ahead and passed the last two tests. He uh, found a, a job with a construction company and realized that's what he's wanted to do all this time. And so he now has been working for a construction company for a little more than two years. There's a picture of him on one of the construction sites. And, and oh, wow. you can see the joy yeah. in his face and in his smile. And, and that's, that's one of the examples of, of the reason that we do this job and, and what we get to see as a result. Imagine that must be very rewarding to, because that story easily could have been just someone who became homeless for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So to have a part in, in stopping that and you now he may, you know, he has the opportunity to go on and live a successful life, mm -hmm. um, all because of, of you and what you guys did. Mm -hmm. It is rewarding. Yeah. It has good feelings. And you know that you kind of answered one of the questions I wanted to ask of of why there's such a need for this program and this organization, and and part of that's well there's there's people in these situations and that's that's kind of clear that there's people who come on hard times that like you said they've you know they may not have had the same opportunities, um, and I think part of it too is over time as society there's kind of been a breakdown in, in family units of, of, I don't even know the right way to say it, but it seems like, and, and I guess this isn't even a recent thing, but there's, there's people who are kind of failed by their families and, mm -hmm. and that can be a generational thing. If when you look back at some of these generational things of people, um, you know, you, you hear someone's story, realize, oh, okay, now I understand. So, uh, one of the episodes we just did, Love Inc. I'm a volunteer there and I often do intakes with people and, and hear the stories of many people who um, could have really benefited from you <laughs> if they had known about it. Um, 
but your people don't know about these things. And I guess that's part of why I'm doing this podcast too, is to share the word and spread the word. Uh, because if someone doesn't know about what you do and you don't know about them, there's just, that's a miss. Yeah. And then they go on. And um, so what are some of the things you do, I guess, to, to outreach to, to people and try to find those people who may never have heard about you and say, okay, mm-hmm. how can we, um, how can we help more people? Mm-hmm. We maintain contact with the high schools in Yamhill County, the counseling uh, and the administrators, and we receive referrals from the high schools throughout the county for those students who aren't quite making it there. Um, we also maintain contact with the probation, the youth probation department. Um, I attend Newburgh Ministerial Association hmm. um, meetings just to keep keep people aware. We will visit the Chamber of Commerce Greeters networking uh, program from time to time, and once in a while we host a greeters. And uh, just trying to stay in the vision of the community so that they see that we're here. Yeah. Is the Newburgh Ministerial Association, I thought that was only for local pastors. Is that open to other people? At yes, it is. And so sometimes Love, Inc. will uh, have a representative. George Fox uh, usually has representatives that attend that as well. Okay. So it's kind of by invitation they can determine who. I think that. you could invite yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I guess that might be a, a side conversation, but I've kind of wondered mm-hmm. there's uh, especially being a part of Love Inc. and talking yeah. to, to Thomas, um, that whole organization is about helping churches and getting collaboration and that kind of thing. Uh, it's, which it's a very community-minded organization, the New York Ministerial Association. It might be worth reaching out to them. Then. They have with that. <laughs> so that's that's interesting. So you guys are kind of the the safety net in some ways that people, and I was talking to a friend who's a, a dean of students at a, um, a school in Oregon, and he mentioned a lot of these students who they drop out or say they're expelled. Mm-hmm. Someone gets into trouble, they're either suspended or they're expelled. And many times at that point, they don't make it. Mm-hmm. They don't get back and they usually are, aren't motivated to get back on track and graduate. And he was kind of lamenting like, man, there's not really a good safety net. Like a lot of times these people just kind of are pushed out of the system and then they just, you know, who knows what happens. And there's some things that, some efforts to try to um, engage with those people, but it sounds like you kind of have positioned or you has positioned itself as really that station to say, okay, you hear those, those stories or someone drops out or they're spelled. Is that kind of when you engage and, Mm -hmm. and begin to get involved? Yeah, and, and the way it works is uh, we like to have the youth or the young adult contact us to set up the beginning of the enrollment process. It's basically a two-step enrollment process. The first step is to attend one of our orientation sessions. We suggest that they plan on an hour. doesn't always take that long unless they have a lot of questions. And these are generally one-on-one orientation sessions. Sometimes we'll have a a group, but mostly it's one-on-one, where we explain the program and the expectations, and then we ask them to think about it, sleep on it, see if it's something they really want to do. If all they want to do is get their GED, not have to go through the financial literacy course that we offer, and do the internship or the job shadow and all the other kinds of things. If all they want to get is their GED, then we help them get connected with Shemekita's GED program and explain how that works and how they can do that. If they enroll at our program, then, you know, it's all free. And if they wanted to go to Shemekita, we would pay for it. But we give them that option. And if they decide, yeah, we really want to go with the program, then that's where step two comes in. Um, we call it the eligibility interview. Um, and it a lot of paperwork and forms to sign. There's a couple little uh, reading 
test and a math test. It's not a pass or fail, and it's not to see if they're accepted or not accepted. It's just part of the application process okay. that the government requires. And once they do that, then that's it. It's usually like about a week from the time they want to do the orientation until they're actually in the program and and participating. So yes, we do, speaking of the safety net, we do consider ourselves to be part of that. Um, and a, it's a pretty big part, I think, because a lot of our participants just didn't make it in either the the traditional classroom or both both McMinnville and Newburgh have very strong alternative education programs, and some of our participants have tried those, and it just didn't quite fit for them. Yeah. And so we're able to help out. We are also able to enroll youth who are still in school and just provide that additional support. Um, so actually, the government allows us to have 20% of our participants come to us still in school. It's designed you know, for, for those who are no longer in school, the dropouts. But we we are allowed to have 20%. Currently, I think we have about 12% of our participants came to us as in-school youth. Okay. And then the rest came to us as out-of-school youth. So about how many people do you have come through the program each year? Well, um, it's not on a cohort basis so okay. they're 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 enrolling throughout the year currently we're serving about 67 who are both in the active status and in the follow-up status and it's right around 70 is is where our case load floats okay throughout is that the, is that Newburgh and McMinnville yes yes that's the entire county so, um, you know, people living in Yamhill, Carlton, some of them might choose to come to Newburgh to our, our, you know, skill center there, or they might go to McMinnville, Dayton, kind of a halfway point. Amity, McMinnville's closer, as well as Wilhelmina, Sheridan, Grand Ronde. And uh, it's the same program. We just have those two different locations. Okay. So that's a pretty, so, I mean, so the, I don't know what the population at the high school is, but that seems like a, a good chunk of the people who maybe don't go through there. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've done a good job of capturing a lot of those. Yeah. So that's encouraging because I, I didn't even know what, I didn't know really what the demographic of, of who's actually involved in the youth program. Um, so it's, you know, that's encouraging here. So how can, the community get involved. I know this is mostly sponsored by um, the, what was it, the Workforce Innovation Act? Yeah, or, that's right. Yeah. So uh, what about the community? Is there ways for people to um, to contribute or get involved? Or yeah, so we like to, we'd like more businesses to contact us willing to host job shadows and internships. Some of our participants have needs. I mentioned diapers earlier. And we're only allowed to spend that government money to help the participant meet their goals, employment goals and education goals. But many of them have family members. And so we have had donations from community members of money that, that we can take them to the store and get their child some shoes hmm. or whatever they might need. We've um, Last year, uh, one of the Newburgh High School seniors did as her senior project, she gathered baby clothes and other baby necessities, and we were able to give those away to participants who have children. Okay. Yeah. So... 
so is it if you have the resources, you do it yourself, and if not, you refer to a family place a lot of times. Yeah, that's, okay, that's right. Okay, that's a nice partnership, and that's I mean that's one of the things I love about this town is you mentioned what was it in the, was it in the fifties or fifty years ago when this started? It was fifty years ago. Okay, so a the, little plus. So late sixties, early seventies. Okay, so at that time there really were no social services. And now things have changed quite a bit. Yeah. Which is great. Yes, it is great. And there are many resources now. Sometimes there's a challenge coordinating those resources and and helping people that need the resources find them. And are you guys connected with Love Inc.? I don't know. No, I'm not. Uh, Love Inc. is more uh, to network local churches to serve people, as I understand it. Um, but we refer to participants to loving. Okay. Well, and I guess that was, and the reason I say connected, maybe that's not quite the right term. When someone comes into Love, Inc., they do an intake. And, yeah. and from that, we say, oh, you'd be a good fit for, mm-hmm. so we're kind of a clearinghouse, and then we send yeah. people back. Um, but through talking to you, it sounds like, for people who are in that six, I mean, usually they're going to be at least, most of the time, at least 18, but someone in that 18 to 24 year old range, um, you could actually be a really great uh, resource for many of the people who come through that are. That's right. So that may actually be worth a, a conversation. We could get you on our our, yeah. our our list as well to refer back out and educate. So, I mean, there's, there's so many resources. Mm-hmm. And that's, again, one of the things I loved about this podcast is getting to know so many different uh, organizations and saying, okay, how can we collaborate and not be redundant, but also um, send people to the right places. Yeah. And um, a lot of that already happens, but I'm kind of on a mission to help it happen even more. So yeah, I'd I'd be happy to, um, have you met Thomas, by the way, Thomas uh, Bellamo, the new executive director? I'll introduce you guys. I think you guys would have a good chat anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so last question, I know this is kind of, a um, can feel a little bit off the cuff sometimes, but what gives you hope, uh, given your position at, position at, uh, you and Shehalem, uh, you, the family services, what gives you hope for the future of Newburgh? Hmm. Well, uh, the collaboration among, com- uh, community partners is, is a big part of the hope that I, that I find. Um, I, see potential in in participants who come to us and the hope is that we can help unlock that potential so that they you know the next generation can carry on the the good things that are happening in the community and one of the things i've loved about and even just that story you shared about nathan is, you know, who knows what's going to happen with him. Mm -hmm. He could be someone that becomes a voice for uh, for change in the future. Mm -hmm. He could be someone who has a family and his kids could create the next new great invention of our generation. Sure. And, you know, we never know that the the change and the impact we have on one person's life, how that can have a rippling effect Mm -hmm. that goes farther, you know, beyond anything we can imagine. So I want to personally say thank you for investing your time and a, a big chunk of your life into investing into the next generation. I thank you. I, I don't think either of us will ever know the impact that it has, but I all I know is that it's significant. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. It's been great talking to you and learning more about uh, you. And uh, it's a great resource for our town. Look, mm-hmm. look forward to getting this uh, message out to the community. Good. Thank you. Being here. Thank you for tuning in to the Giving Town Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend who you think might benefit from hearing it. While more and more people are continuing to hear about this podcast, I still need your help to spread the message about all the people and organizations that make Newburgh so great. Well, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode.